Since you survived yesterday's uh, combat, uh, there may be some people that are wounded, others may not be so well, but this morning we're going to have four presentations in our first block, four excellent presentations, all of them related to cybersecurity. So I hope you can make the most of, of them. They are still putting, fixing things for the next speaker. The next speaker is Imelda Naleli Flores. So here comes the next speaker, Imelda Flores is uh, the leader of, uh, uh, she works in uh, Sitem, Mexican, and uh, she's going to talk about lessons learned in more than 100 cases of ransomware. You have 30 minutes, that includes your presentation and uh, some time for questions. Perfect. I'm going to try not to go any further than 30 minutes. I want to thank Leknik for inviting me. Today, I want to talk about ransomware because this is the big problem we have today. And many organizations are worried about it. Especially, I'm honored to direct C-Labs that is, among other things, the SITM, that is the cyber intelligence uh, arm of uh, America uh, Mobile. So even when I am presenting this, this is the work of a lot of people at Silabs and SITM. So there we've had over 200 cases of ransomware with data centers with total uh, uh, impact on uh, the uh, data centers, etc. So first, we're going to see the main families of ransomware in Latin America, the most affected countries in the region. I'm going to talk of how people behave when there are, they are being attacked with ransomware, some general observations, and especially the main lessons learned, because I could talk for hours for, of the lessons learned. Let us start with uh, the description of a typical ransomware case. Typically, the attackers try to use valid accounts, and a way they can use it is, as the previous speaker said, is through stealers. And the other way is remote desk exposed to the internet uh, in an insecure manner. That should never happen. So it, it should always be, be behind a VPN. There are organizations that uh, permit it, and these are entries that attackers uh, love. Then you have uh, vulnerable machines uh, that are um, used by attackers. So once they enter, they try to scale up privilege, or at least having more privileges than with the initial amount. So they go to the antivirus uh, and uh, the administration. They love the antivirus uh, consoles because they usually have administration uh, counts with very high administration power that enable them to move all around the place. With Once they secure their credential, they move to other, um, they, they start with lateral movement. But the place where they all want to reach is the Active Directory. The jewels of the crown of organizations is the, the Active Directory. We didn't used to see things like this. It wasn't like this but the, for the rest of the organizations, but attackers found that it's uh, the core site for all organizations. And as soon as you get, if the Active Directory uh, falls, then everything falls. 
then they can move to storage, to the database, to SAV, to other active directories in other cities, etc. And that is why it is so important to reach the active directory. But not just that, once they reach the databases to in a place from which they can draw information, they extract the information so that when they encrypt, they've already uh, stolen. Uh, many organizations uh, pay for the information that was robbed not to go public. Um, so once they receive this, uh, that once the the, infiltra the information has been exfiltrated, then we see that it takes from one to two weeks from the time they enter until they um, send a launch a ransomware attack. There may be, in addition to the ransomware, there may be other kinds of attacks in the same place, in the same server, at the same time, but with different uh, uh, goals. This is a case of ransomware. So they look for the attackers uh, at the time they execute, because those of us who investigate this type of attacks, they make life difficult for us. It's very important to find the artifact where that is encrypted, because that helps us understand where it is located, how it is moving, and uh, the other machines that the, the attacker may be using. If the organization doesn't pay, they publish it in their blogs. They call them shaming blogs. And basically, they start by uh, say, I attacked such and such an organization. After some days, they start releasing the, the data they extracted, but especially um, uh, information that uh, is not so valuable and they can't send. So having seen how ransom w works, let's see uh, Latin America, what happens. One of the things that our team does is to focus on what happens in the region. We are very interested in knowing what happens from Mexico to the south. First ranks Brazil, then Mexico, Argentina, then Colombia, and the rest of the countries. This is data of the second uh, semester of uh, uh, 2022, and this is a combination between what was is published and by the most active attackers in the region. What we have to, uh, we are reported as C certs, and. Uh, by statements of the people who declare that they have been compromised. But there are some families that are very active in the region. Three of them may sound familiar because they have appeared in the headlines of the different sites. One of them is Lockheed uh, 3.0, not only in Latin America, but uh, you have Black Bite. So you have Black Cat, Lockbit 3.0, and Bla uh, Black Bite. So Black Bite had been seen in several countries of Latin America, not so much in Mexico, but in recent times they loved Mexico. So it's a great place for them. And the other families. There you'll see that other families uh, want the territory. Not only are we speaking of a certain ransomware, well, that it, it, it were, operates in ransom as a service. Ransomware as a service is a group of attackers that are that create these malicious artifacts uh, to uh, giving annals of how to enter the organization, how to distribute distribute the the organization, but there are some that can work with two ransomware families at the same time, and depending on who gives more yield. 25% is typically uh, remains in the hands of the ransomware created, and 75% the person who executed uh, the attack. On the other hand, the industries that are most attacked change with time, but usually it's the service industry, hotels, government, uh, financial sector, and especially I can tell you that many manufacturers are affected by ransomware. But ransomware doesn't care so much about industry. What they care is where they can cause sufficient pain so that the organization will end up paying for uh, the 
ransomware. They don't attack for sports. They attack because they they know what they want. And with some variants of ransomware, they even uh, end up calling the director of the company and say, don't suffer anymore. If you pay soon, we'll give you a discount to that degree. Or they say, well, don't tell us you don't have any money. We have the financial statements. So that's a, they, they, they want to, they typically find out how much is your worth. But on the other hand, what are the general things in all these attacks? What are the big observations? What we can tell you is that in general terms, the organizations, at least in the continent, that are attacked with ransomware lose not to have EDR. EDR is uh, people who install in the machines that is much more advanced of, it's the uh, endpoint de detection and response, more advanced than antivirus. Many organizations that are attacked don't, do not have EDR or have it partially, because many of you who have to deal with administrators receive the question, how am I going to reboot uh, the server? Am I going to put something in the network because I'm going to install? So uh, in a case of ransomware, everything falls and you have to start from zero. How am I going to um, stop the service to, for that vulnerability? Uh, after a ransomware attack, you have to rebuild things from scratch. On the other hand, what is common in all these ransomware attacks is that there is no double authentication factor, or it is partial. There are, the many organizations say that they have a double authentication, but maybe they are not implementing it. In, uh, they may not have uh, double factors to access their servers and uh, their network. It is also quite common that there is no visibility at land level, so it's done totally blindly. It's like those organizations that have excess of permissions, of account permissions. They all have permissions as administrative because they think they need this, so they use the administrator permissions in the local machine. They connect through the personal machines. This is These credentials are stolen, so the attacker can buy these for ten dollars so this excess of account permissions is no useful and the other thing is that in the security world there is a lot of scarcity of personnel and most of the security teams don't are understaffed so there you have the warnings but because they didn't have someone 24 7 these were not seen and because these were not seen nobody did anything didn't did anything to correct this at the same time there is a lack of vulnerability management or people take months to patch the vulnerabilities and this ends up becoming a problem in addition to that in latin america we have lots of legacy system old equipment and for many reasons because we think we have to follow intense processes before changing a device or because the code doesn't work in the new version or we were not authorized for budget reasons but latin america has a lot of legacy system and old devices that can no longer be updated so this makes us the ideal place for becoming the attacker's lab. Yes, in Latin America, we have a lot of attacks, and it's not only that we are the labs for the attackers, because they know nothing will happen. And in fact, we have seen attacks that are tested for the first time, malware versions that are tested for the first time, and all of a sudden, they add other modules and are in production in other places. In addition to that, there are, there's lots of shadow IT servers. So if you scan your networks, there are servers that you don't even know about and they don't apply the convention for names. Nobody knows who put that there or you have no idea whether it should be there or not. Or also they did a test and it's there, it was there for a couple of years. In addition to that, there is all a lot of bad network segmentation. I know many of you are carriers and you need things to flow, but the point is that, for example, a branch 
up in the mountain can reach your forum. Well, this does become a problem in the case of ransomware because it propagates so rapidly. And then there are not of alerts as we don't have a 24-7 staff. There are so many staffs that there is not enough time to analyze all these and then to act accordingly. And what does this lead to? Namely that there are many, many cases and only a limited percentage of victims have some kind of cyber insurance. And the majority who pay this do so because they have operations in Europe or in the United States. Now, going into the details and the lessons learned over this time and after so many ransomware cases is that this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. And I don't know if you're aware or if you ever imagined this. In the case of ransomware, investigation takes to four to six, from four to six weeks, so it will take days to recover. Imagine if a directory ends at uh, being of no use at all and cannot be accessed or the attacker entered that server and eliminated all your backups so you can you have nowhere to recover it. And this is what occurs when you have a ransomware case. So this is days. And on many occasions, the organizations are focused on recovering things. They don't prioritize investigation. So ultimately, they people don't sleep for 72 hours. And when the time comes to investigate yet further, Everyone is so tired that coffee doesn't have an effect. So what we tell the organizations is send half of your staff to sleep because this won't take two or three days. It will take weeks to solve. So it's very important to prioritize things. This is a marathon. You won't have an answer in two days' time. And maybe in three or four days, that won't be the case either. At the same time, among the lessons learned is that there are several paths when in the case of ransomware, one has to do with investigation. Investigation take from one to six weeks. And the race is to find the malicious data that give you a great idea as to how the ransomware occurred. Another path is recovery. And this must be a different team because those who are in charge of recovering things are the owners of the system. So recovery, unfortunately, can take from days two months. Some organizations have taken more than one year and haven't fully recovered what had been stolen. And the important point here is to have a recovery manager, so someone who does follow up to the entire team, devices that are recovered. And these, these are not recovered with obsolete uh, versions. So if the organization is attacked, two times or another because this was done with obsolete versions, so they didn't learn anything in the end. So a third path is communication, and this has been done differently. In the case of communication in Latin America is how we all like to say, well, nobody knows anything, I didn't see anything, it wasn't me, everything's okay. So the concept is that transparency is of key importance, both towards the staff and outwards. So the greater the transparency, the better. One of the many clients we have worked with in Latin America specifically asked us to prepare a document explaining how the attack vector had been, which were the compromised elements. So we said, well, we were compromised and this is how things occurred. And you know what the result was? This client over time was grateful for all the trust that was generated. Now, along the way, could I have helped others? Well, one of the things that the attackers do on a daily basis is I won't repeat myself. Because considering all the cases we have worked on, never ever have we seen cases where a malicious IP address is repeated or even a hash or a domain. Attackers never repeat. repeat indicators. 
they said, well, uh, this place, they attacked this person or the other. Do you have the indicator or whatever? But this will be of no use at all. The attacks are very specific, highly targeted and custom made for the organization that will be compromised. So compared to banking Trojans where compromise indicators are repeated, but this is not the case of ransomware. In the case of ransomware, the compromise indicators are never repeated. Now, what are the things that are repeated? The tools are repeat, but even so, they are obscured, so this is not so easy to recognize. These tools include specific tools to do specific reconnaissance, particularly in the Active Directory. So one of the things that they like to do is to attack the Active Directory. There are some specific tools for network sending. Other tools are used for lateral movement. And it is likely that many of you are familiar with PSXEC, and you say, well, I use it every day. Well, it's precisely about that, like living off the land, something that the attackers use from the systems themselves in order to move laterally and to be unobtrusive because they perform in a similar way compared to a network manager. Then there are post-exploitation frameworks in other world to maintain persistence in the network. Then there are other tools used for exfiltration of information, and this occurs prior to the attack. Now, the important thing about exfiltration is that if they realize that you realize that they use similar tools to the ones you use on a daily basis. So it's very difficult to detect these if you don't have well thought controls in your operations. But what we always say is, once you come across a ransomware case, it's as if someone died in the organization. You should see the faces when they go and check the systems, the one they a system that took so long to maintain, and they open it and it's encrypted. So we created then the grieving cycle of ransomware, which is based on the five grieving stages. And the denial stage, the organization really sort of resist recognizing that this has happened. The attackers use the Active Directory to distribute the ransomware. Many cases uh, through planned tasks or other situations. Now, the problem with the denial is that very frequently isolating the Active Directory can be helpful, but the organization resists isolating the Active Directory or storage. They just wait to see if magically they can recover the encrypted files. But the families who work in the region use encryption that is quite robust, so it's not possible to re recover this. At the other, at the same time, this does not involve the incident response team, and this is quite a problem because as time goes by, the logs get broken, and then they don't have sufficient information to proceed. Then we have the anger stage. So here the CEO gets angry with the CISO. He gets angry at the IoT guys. And if it's the CISO, he gets angry with the IT person. And the CISO gets angry with the incident response team. And the general director gets angry because they didn't tell him specifically that they had to do that investment in security. They really had to change that server and they wasn't so clear. They didn't really spelt out the need and they're all um, affected by this. And then we have the bargaining stage. The IT department starts to push back complex recommendations, say, well, they sort of resist communicating things publicly. And there comes a time where they haven't slept for so many hours. They have practically not eaten anything because the workload is so big. They get the depression stage, and finally, they accept things and overcome the differences between the IT guys and the network guys. So if you look at this, we see all these different cycles. They don't all go exactly one after the other, but more or less it helps like this. 
And one of the other lessons we learned is that it's not so good to have too many incident response teams active at the same time because all of a sudden one team wishes to investigate but they don't have access to the same evidence. So in the case of ransomware, it's better to have one leading incident response team and if you need the support of another team, just involve these for certain clearly specified stages and who leads the entire investigation. And one of the other lessons learned is that there is always data exfiltration, although there is no evidence. The top management will like to persuade you that, well, there's no evidence that this was exfiltrated, so the council should not be told that this took place if we have no evidence. So in our experience, in all ransomware cases, data exfiltration takes place. So though there is no evidence, it is very likely that there has been data exfiltration. In addition to that, the exfiltration data that are most common tend to use tools that are, we are familiar with, either Mega, or Clone, or Dropbox information, or through uh, Google Drive, or whatever. So disconnecting the Active Directory can save the rest of the network if this isn't encrypted, because it is here where many attackers really apply the ransomware. At the same time, when you have a case of ransomware, it is important to validate the planned, the programmed activities. When was the last GPO done? Because these are two of the main things that attackers do. And if the PowerShell script, uh, that leverage window shares. So everyone, the jump servers make the life of the attacker easier if they are not well hardened. Because they make life easier for them precisely, because how many network uh, administrators love to leave uh, the, their RPG, their secure RT with all the users, with all the passwords, all ready to double click and just log in. Or they love to leave the TXA with the, with the username and uh, the password. Now, when the attackers enter, they just have to copy those, uh, copy those uh, passwords and they don't have to invest time looking for more uh, passwords. So as administrators, it is very important for you to be careful as to what you leave in the jump servers. Another lesson learned is the importance of rebuilding the Active Directory first, because in the case of ransomware, some people say, no, let's uh, reconstruct this uh, business app first. But they don't realize that unless they prioritize the Active Directory, they won't be able to access uh, to uh, to access any uh, backup or the databases won't work because they don't have authentication on the other hand everything is connected now on the other hand it is important to have what we call a laundry network or a gray network or recovery network. Basically what the concept means is that you have your network that has been compromised, everything is wrong, but it is very good to have an intermediate, a gray network isolated where you may be rebuilding um, so they start uh, uh, hardening the server, installing EDR, adding MFA, inspecting backups. Um, they inspect that they don't have anything bad. You apply the patches, um, avoiding any vulnerabilities. And once uh, it's ready, you start with production. This is the best way to go back to production. Some people say, no, it's too difficult, it's impossible, I can't do it, and they end up, the attacker ends up encrypting again what had been reconstructed. Imagine how painful that is for an organization. Did you believe that, you, so you thought that the attacker had uh, uh, left uh, and uh, 
but no, they stay there and they want you to suffer more. Why would they leave? They can press you so that you'll pay faster. On the other hand, what we have also learned is that people may believe that if a server is not encrypted, it does not mean it's not compromised, and that's false. It doesn't matter. If something is not encrypted, it doesn't mean that it's not compromised. Rather, the contrary, when the domain controls are not being encrypted, it's because the attacker is using it to keep its presence in the network. And uh, it uh, sometimes they say, well, no, they. No, that's not the way it works. On the other hand, we have also learned that, unfortunately, the most destructive cases happen on weekends and holidays. That is precisely when organizations uh, lower their arms. So uh, next uh, we next uh, holidays or Christmas, don't send everybody on holidays because it is then that you have to pay more attention. And finally, I'd like to tell you that uh, uh, preparation is key. Everything I just said can be mitigated. I'm not telling you it won't happen, but the, there are many things in the way that you can mitigate. Having a good EDR, a good segmentation, the equivalent is the equivalent to eating fruit and vegetables for our health and practicing what to do in a case of ransomware. Who are you going to tell? Where are the backups? Are they really offline? How are you going to do things that can help us be better prepared vis-a-vis -vis one of these situations? Thank you. Thank you, Imelda. We, we've run out of time, but please, if you have any questions, uh, ask it in the break, during the break. Thank you, Imelda. That was a very interesting presentation. So again, a round of applause for her. Entonces, eh... So, before introducing the next speaker, I'm going to